Today we're looking at Romans chapter 8, verses 32 through 34. We're going to look at the liberation of the saints. Freedom from sin comes through a blood sacrifice. And I would say only a blood sacrifice. Uh, I've heard it said that Jesus could have died any way that he wanted to, and you could have been saved. And I would say, no, that's not good. Because the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, without the shedding of blood. So God had predetermined when Jesus came to this earth, he came to die the death of a cross, and he came to shed that innocent blood because only the blood of Jesus saves. Let me tell you about my Jesus. You see, that's what we need to be focusing on in the 21st century. We need to get away from politics and other such things and start telling people that there is a Savior. We do need a Savior. That Savior is the Lord Jesus. And that Savior shed His blood willfully, freely, so that you could have forgiveness of your sins, so that when you face death and you have the assurance that you're going to go to heaven. That's the only assurance we have. Are you saved this morning? Yes. Man, that's the most important question that you'll ever have asked to you or that you can ever answer. It's already saved. If you found your place this morning, would you turn, would you stand with me? Romans chapter 8. We're going to look at 32 through 34 today. Remember we ended last week when it says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And then it says, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? <clears throat> who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Man, what a loaded verse. Four things that God, that, that Jesus did for you, uh, and, and God the Father was in participation in doing that. Uh, Brother Ben, would you mind praying for us this morning? I have to thank you for what a wonderful verse in the Bible today. It's, uh, it should inspire each one of us in our hearts. And as Patrick said, the most important question this morning, are we, are we saved? Please open our minds and our hearts for the message of the Lord to receive this morning. We're always thanking you. Amen. Amen. You may be saved. Thank you for standing. As we look at our text this morning, we're going to see the work of the Father and of the Son in our redemption. If you study Scripture out, you'll find that all three persons of the Godhead have a part in your redemption. The triunity of God work together to accomplish your salvation. The first thing I see in this verse is the work of the sovereign is great display. Notice how it starts off. It says, he who, in, in the Greek language, this is a double emphatic use of a personal pronoun, and that is to bring your attention right to the very start of this verse. It is God who, God, not man. We have too many man-made religions in our world today. We have too many false religions that are teaching a works salvation. We, are, we have too many theologians who are now teaching a watered-down grace. Friends, grace is a powerful act of God whereby through His determined will, He gives you the ability to believe and to come closer to Him. The Bible says, none seek after God, no, not one. The Bible says that all have seen and come short of the glory of God. So we will not seek God on our own. So through God's amazing grace and the powerful movement of God's grace in your life, He brings you to that point of salvation. It strengthens and makes you understand that it's God and God alone. Because what, what did it just say in verse 31? If God is for us, who can be against us? No human being. The devil will accuse you. He'll bring it back up. Oh, yeah, he'll bring your past up to you. He'll try to shame you. He'll try to guilt you. But you know what? That's gone. The Bible says it's in the bottom of the sea. It's as far as the east is from the west. And, and when God forgives you, he gives you absolutely, completely. There is no list 
of sins where God forgives this one and this one, but no, you can't forgive that one. And see, if you've been back to the Baptist church any period of time, you know that we as Baptists used to have a list. God could forgive this sin and that sin and that sin, but oh man, when it came to certain sins in the church, no, couldn't do that. Man-made legalism, may I say to you. It is God, He, who served to draw your attention, who did not want to spare His own Son. The word spare means to spare in respect to hard dealing with. Uh, the, the word literally means to, to, uh, to be tender of or to treat with tenderness, to avoid or to refrain from something. This is the exact same word that is used over in Genesis 22 when Abraham is about to uh, offer Isaac. And the word there that, that is used, it says in verse uh, 22, verse 12, And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to harm him, for I know that you fear God since you have not withheld. There's the word. Withheld. Spare. Your own son, your only son from me. Then in verse 16 it says again, And said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing, what? Offered up Isaac getting ready to stab it, believing that God could raise him from the dead. Your only son. Now, isn't it ironic that when we read this passage that we see Abraham was spared having to kill his own son, but God did not spare his own son from, the, from, from bearing the sin of the world. Does that make sense? He didn't withhold him. He didn't hold him back. He didn't treat him with tenderness and kindness. There's not a person in here who would give their child for me. Not a person in this place would die for somebody else. But God said that His Son would come to this earth with the intention of dying on the cross for you and I. Man, what a powerful concept that is. Second, look at the gift the, the delivered. It said delivered up to give it to the power of someone or to give over uh, to someone else. Uh, it represents the Father's participation in the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and it says for us, <clears throat> here's our big word uh, of substitution, who par in the Greek. It simply means in place of us. Jesus died in my place. He died in your place. He had never sinned. And I don't care what you may hear on some of these newer fangled preachers who, who dress with their skinny jeans on and their hair curled up and popped out here and there. Jesus died in place of you. He did not sin. He bore the burden of your sin. In Galatians 2.20, the same word for delivered up is used. When Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, but yet I live. But I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, delivered up himself to the cross. Jesus was not a martyr. He was not some religious lunatic. He was not someone trying to, he was not a, a fanatic trying to start a new religious system. He was Almighty God in the flesh that was going to die for the sin that I had committed. A sinless Savior. That is one of those cardinal doctrines that we cannot allow the world to erode away from. And I know more and more people, or any preachers, listen to me, preachers who stand in the pulpit are willing to say now that Jesus sinned. Hmm. Friends, I've got news for you. If Jesus ever sinned in any respect whatsoever, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. Because we're basing what uh, our hope on what Jesus did on Calvary. And if Jesus sinned, he couldn't have went to Calvary. He went simply as a martyr for a cop. But he didn't. He went as a redeemer, saving his people that he had created way back in Genesis 1-1. He created us, and now he has redeemed us through the blood of the Lamb. John 1-29 says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. That's the only way that we're going to get into heaven. And God delivered him up for us in our place where we should have died. I told you before, there was an old song years and years ago that, that was, uh, I should have been crucified. They were coming to take me away. 
But then a voice was heard that said, no, take me instead. Is that much God loves you? How much God wants you to have fellowship and communion with Him? And we, and we neglect it every day to exercise our fellowship with God and our communion with God. So there was grace displayed, there was gift delivered. Look at the grant decided. Notice the next part of that verse. It says, But deliver him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Freely given to bestow in kindness, to grant as a favor willingly. You do not earn God's grace. Right. You do not deserve God's grace. It is a grace is an act of God whereby He grants you His blessings and His favor simply because of His will, not of anything of you. You're not before you got saved, God didn't look at you and say, Oh, it not that a nice looking gentleman. He's strong. He keeps himself in, in shape. He's, he's mentally sharp. I think I'll take that. God didn't do that. Before you were created, God said, I'm going to take a certain number. And if you follow in that number, hallelujah. If you're not, you can be. You can be one of the whosoever will. Just because there's elect doesn't mean whosoever will can't be saved, right? Right? Y'all with me? Freely given. To give or bestow freely. Peter said, and he believed it so strongly, and Peter had walked with the Lord in 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, I'm sorry, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, the Bible says there, as his divine power has given to us what? All things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. That's simply saying that everything that you need to be saved today, God's given you. Everything you need to live a Christian life, God has given you. Go back to Romans chapter 8. It says that all things work together. Right? All things. Persecutions, trials, sadness, sorrow, work together for your good in the eternal perspective so that when we get to heaven, we can look back on this world and say what a joy it is to be in heaven. I'm glad I'm done with the old life. I'm looking forward to the new life. I am to put off the old man with his weaknesses and his temptations. And I'm to put on the new man that is empowered by God, the Holy Spirit. And God has given us that as a favor. I mean, don't that just blow you away? How many of you did somebody a favor this week and didn't want something back for it? <laughs> that got to get home, didn't it? How many of you we just willingly went out and said, hey, I'm going to pay for that person's groceries when I get to the counter? Or at a restaurant, hey, I think I'll pay for that person's bill. I don't care what he has, I'm going to pay for it. And didn't expect something back. See, God gave you something free that didn't cost you a thing, and he doesn't expect anything back. Because it's a free gift. God willfully does that for you and I. But then look at the guaranteed defense. Look at verse 33. It says there, Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? There's an inquiry there. A charge, called to account, to accuse, to arraign, or to prosecute in a court of law. Isn't this interesting that just back a couple of verses in verse 30, it said God had justified us? When he started off verse 32, he wanted to make sure that you knew it was God who was doing this because he used a double empathic so you would call your attention to it. And then in the very next verse, then he says, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Why? Because it is God who justifies. The insurer is that God. Present act to make or render right or just to hold us guiltless. We talked about this two weeks ago. What I want to add to this is simply this. Justification is a one-time act of God when you got saved. But it's also an ongoing uh, ministry of Christ to you because we need to be justified every day. Right. Because we sin every day. Right. Aren't you glad God's got you covered? Amen. Man, I'm glad when I ride down the road and something crazy pops in your head like somebody cuts you off and you want to tick, tick. And you go, thank you, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. <laughs> We do that, right? I 
thing we have to, I think that really tests your sanctification, Brother Robert. But see, God's got you covered. You make a mistake. It's not wrong to make a mistake, folks. It's wrong to stay in that mistake. It's wrong not to confess it and get it right with God and, and refresh that fellowship and that communion that we have with God because God loves you so much, God gave you that right. And if I've got the right to communicate with God, I need to communicate with Him. I need to spend time praying. You can ride down your car, your road in a car and talk to God. You can be in your tractor in the field on the back side of nowhere and be in communication with God. You can be on a deer stand where you think there's nobody in miles of you and you can talk to God. Why? Because God loves you enough that He wants to talk to you because He's concerned about what's going on in your life, right? I don't believe in theism. That's, that's, that doesn't make sense to me how people can believe in that. I want a personal God. I want a God who knows all about me and who cares about me. I don't want a God who's way out there somewhere, who's the cosmic other. I don't want that. I want a God who knows how I feel when I'm disappointed and how I feel when I hurt, when I lose a loved one or, or something doesn't go right. Or, or yeah, I, I, I want I want someone who knows me. That's personal. Now let's look at the work of the Son. I told you the other week there's four works of God, four works of the Son, and four works of the Holy Spirit that cannot be undone in your salvation. Any theology in that you read the book will we, we, we'll give you those basic four things. So let's look at the work of the Son. I thought this verse was so important that we could have spent a, a pretty good time on it, but we're just going to spend this, just a few minutes here looking at it. Look at the price demanded in verse 34. It says, who, okay, let me go back for a minute. When it says God has justified you, why would God justify you and then withhold something from you? That makes sense? Doesn't, does it? So because, did not, because God did not spare His own Son, and he justified you through what the Son done, then God is willing to do everything for you that you need every single day. That's why everything is important to God. Not the big things so much as the itty bitty things. See, God doesn't always speak in a miraculous voice. A lot of times, God speaks in that still, quiet moment when you're alone with it in your prayer call, on your knees, on the floor, in front of your desk, that's when God speaks to you. First of all, look at verse 34. Who is he who condemns? Well, the answer there is nobody. Present act of tense, continuing thing, to pronounce sentence, to give judgment against. Who can judge you? God's already justified you. Because he's given you everything that you need to grow spiritually and to live a spiritual life in this world. The, uh, the <clears throat> it says, who condemns? Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. Died. Uh, the word literally means to die physical death. But when somebody <coughs> chooses to Jesus, it always means to die for sin or on account of sin. To make an atonement and satisfaction for it. Do we need to get into a big discussion of what the blood of Jesus did? It satisfied the holy, just demands of God. God was holy and just. He's righteous. He has a right to condemn sin. The Bible never once, anywhere, attributes sin or evil to God. But all through it, God condemns it. And He has a right to condemn it because He is holy and, and, and He is just. It says, who shall bring a charge uh, because it was Christ who died. Who, shall, who, who is he who condemned? It is Christ who died. And furthermore, he prevailed over death. He's risen. Amen. I don't serve a dead martyr. I don't serve a dead religious leader. I serve a risen Savior. That's right. I told you a million times, Easter is my favorite time of year. Easter. I love Christmas. Everybody's in a good mood, giving stuff, blah, blah, blah. But Easter means more to me spiritually than anything else. That's right. Because there I see the absolute reality of what my sin cost God. 
And I see the glory and the beauty of a graceful, compassionate Redeemer who looks on me and has pity on me. And that's through the resurrection of Jesus. And because Jesus prevailed over death, that means that we're going to prevail over death, right? Because if Jesus had stayed in the grave, however you look at it, he'd be just like you and I. But because he resurrected with a glorified body, then I know that when I die, this body will go to the cemetery, sure, but the soul goes to be with Jesus. So, he gave himself for the price for us. He prevailed over death because he's God and death could not hold him. It had nothing on him. Because death is the result of sin, right? The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Who what? Resurrect. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. It says, but God commended or demonstrated his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, that Christ died for in my place. Us, you and I. So, the third work of the Son is his position of dignity. Notice that it says that the right hand, the right hand was the highest mark of honor and dignity that a person could bestow upon someone. The Persian king or a, or a Roman emperor, whatever it was, uh, the person ruling, if you sat at their right hand, that was the highest position that you could get besides the king. And Jesus is sitting on the throne with the Father. Isn't that great? Amen. He did that because he loved you and I. And he did that to get us to the point that, that when we get to heaven, that we're going to see Jesus. Because Jesus is the judge, according to John. And with Jesus being the judge and our defense attorney, how about that? He's seated at the right hand, the place of dignity, and he also has a prayer of defense. Look at the next part of that verse. It says that he makes intercession, perfect act of tense. He is constantly, constantly praying for you. That means that you should be constantly praying to him. People say, well, how do you do that? You do it mentally. You don't need to be on your knees to talk to God. Amen? Somebody says, say yes or no. You don't have to be on your knees to talk to God. You can talk to him anywhere you take a notion, anytime you take a notion, because God is always on, on the job. He never takes a vacation. He never goes to sleep. He's never gone. The intercession simply means to plead the cause of a case of someone. Isn't it interesting that back in verse 26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know how to pray uh, as we should ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession. 1 John 1, 2 says that we have an advocate, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, our defender. So who's going to condemn us? Why would Jesus give his life for us and then turn around and condemn us? What would he be in essence saying? What would God in essence be saying if he judged you and, and, uh, and brought a charge against you? He'd literally be saying that my blood sacrifice was no good. That you still got sin on you. You still live it in, in a worldly manner. But when he accepted the blood atonement of Jesus, and he did that by raising him up out of that grave, when he accepted him, that means everybody that believes in the Lord Jesus is justified at one time with a continuing result. And that means that when you stand before God, God does not see you as you are. He sees you as he wants you to be. And that is sinless. Doesn't it say in Ephesians that God is preparing his bride as a, as a bride without spot or blemish? Isn't it great? That when I get to heaven, God's going to look at me and he's going to say, I knew you were coming. He's not going to say that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> he knows I'm going to be there. And we're going to be there. And see, we, we, when you get to heaven and you're going to look back on your life, if we do that, who knows whether we do or not? I mean, some people say, you know, blah, 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 blah. That's, you don't know that. Why would I say that? What you can say 
is when you get to heaven, it's just going to be around the throne of God, and with the 24 elders that's already there, and the four living creatures, you're going to be able to pr praise and worship God day and night. That's good stuff. I don't know what it's going to consist of, but it's better than going to work in the morning. <laughs> it's going to be great. And what does this all come down to? This is talking about assurance and security. Next week, when we're going to get into the last part of this, may make two sermons out of it. There's a lot of stuff there. But what I'm, what I'm talking about, this whole chapter started off with what? There is no, therefore now no judgment, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Twice he's already told you that he's justified you. Twice he's already said that you've got an advocate and, and, a, and, an, uh, uh, and, a, and an intercessor that is praying for you. So with all of that stacked up, he, it's, Paul's like he's in the courtroom and he's building his case. He started off giving his propositional statement, there's no condemnation. Why, Paul? Obvious question. And then he starts to tell you. And he starts to build his case and build his case and build his case. And what Paul is wanting you to do is to get more and more confident of your standing with God. Because you can't live a happy, you can't have joy if you're afraid of God. Amen, preacher, that's right. You cannot be joy and enjoy your life and be afraid that you're going to die and go to hell. But when you know that God loves you enough and he has given you all of this evidence stacked up on top of each other and Paul's trying to close this thing out now because then he's going to move on to Israel, right? And God's sovereignty over Israel. And right now he's trying to say there's a new people of God that's you believers and because you are who you are because God made you who you are then he's given you all of this evidence that you can live life in a sin-cursed world and have joy in your heart and be content, whatever the, the case may be. Amen. Again, that's how much God loves you. I'm going to ask you again, are you saved this morning? Amen. Ask you another hard question. I get in trouble with you. Are you serving God? Are you serving God? with the gifts that he gave you, with the talents that he's given you? Are you a Sunday Christian or are you an everyday Christian? Are you making a difference in the world where you live? If, if we're not making a difference, what good are we? And if you're saved this morning, God wants you to serve. And that's what this church is all about. Every church is all about serving. It's about you serving God through serving in a local church to serve the community that God placed you in. Are we serving? Are we as a church serving our community? Are we doing anything that makes a difference in the lives of people? We know that our salvation is guaranteed. We've got the assurance of that and the security of that. But are we living? Are we practicing what we preach? Father, Lord, I know your word has accomplished the task for which you set it out this morning. I pray that we have heeded the word that we have listened with the intention of obeying what you have said. Father, help us to take seriously our position in you that guarantees us eternal life. The Bible says, freely you have been given, so freely give. And I pray, Father, this way that we can go out into this community, various places where we work, that we would make a difference. We would be the light that others need to see. We would be the truth that others need to hear. And we could point them to the way through the Lord Jesus to eternal life. We pray today in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.